Afternoon everyone. The first item of business today is portfolio questions and in order to get as many people in as possible I'd be grateful for short and succinct questions and indeed answers. Question 1, Sarah Boyack. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding EU issues. Minister Humza Yousaf. Uh, officer, the Scottish Government regularly meets with the UK Government to discuss EU issues. The Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop and I uh, recently met with David Liddington, the UK Minister for Europe, on the 11th of November this year for discussions on key elements of the UK Government's EU renegotiation and the forthcoming referendum on the UK's membership of the EU. The Scottish Government also attends quarterly GMC, Joint Ministerial Committee on Europe meetings. The next one is on 7th of December. Thanks, Sarah Blatt. The Cabinet Secretary for, sorry, can I thank the Minister for that answer? Um, can he give me the assurance that the Scottish Government will vigorously defend EU environmental legislation as part of the fitness check the Commission is conducting and do everything it can to encourage the UK and other devolved administrations to adopt a consistent approach to this crucial regulation, which is one of the bedrocks of environmental protection? Minister. I thank the member uh, for that question. I can certainly give uh, reassurance. Also, thank her for, Minister. Thank yeah. her for our promotion uh, as well, which is very kind. But uh, in terms of the refit and the environmental uh, legislation and the directives and the advice that's been taken, I think it's been raised by a number of stakeholders. I want to thank the stakeholders in Scotland have had it raised by a number of stakeholders. And some of the elements of that, of course, do give us concern. I think we're listening to those stakeholders. I can give an absolute assurance uh, that it has been raised and that we'll continue to raise it. And if the member wishes, I'll continue to feed back to how those discussions are going. Okay, thanks. Question two, Graham Day. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it encourages TV companies to provide region-specific programming across Scotland. Uh, the Scottish Government believes that broadcasting should be fully devolved as set out in the proposed amendments to the Scotland Bill. However, we are continuing to engage with all of our public uh, service broadcasters on this issue and have made it clear through the Charter renewal process that there is a need for increased national representation in TV and radio services that the BBC provide for Scotland. We acknowledge the important role that local television services play in strengthening public service broadcasting in Scotland, note the success of the STV channels in Edinburgh and Glasgow and welcome the services that are due to launch in Aberdeen Air and Dundee in the future. Thanks. Graham Day. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. The STV maintains an appropriately resourced presence in Dundee, delivers a Tayside-specific news slot across the platforms, and as the Cabinet Secretary noted, will launch a dedicated STV Dundee channel in early 2017 to serve the wider Tayside area. This resourcing and level of, of service to the area is in marked contrast to that of the BBC. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what influence the Scottish Government might bring to bear to ensure the city of Discovery and wider region is treated more appropriately by the BBC? Cabinet Secretary. I welcome uh, STV's commitment to Dundee and the Angus area. And indeed, I think it's interesting to note that uh, Ofcom's third public service broadcasting review shows 81% of those questions said STV's new pro news programmes provide a wide range of good quality news about my area. And of course, in relation to the BBC, its own reports state that under 50% of people in Scotland thought the BBC was good at representing their life in news and current affairs content. Clearly, STV has to be established in the area, but clearly in terms of the, uh, the competition aspect, that will have pressure on the BBC. Uh, but clearly, I think in terms of uh, the, the service provision for Scotland, the more that we can have produced in Scotland and a news agenda that is reflective of Scotland, whether that's on a national basis or indeed locally, that will benefit the, the audiences of the BBC. But clearly, there's a, a, a new operator uh, in Dundee, and I think that will have some healthy competition uh, for audience and viewership. A microphone for Claire Baker, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will know that STV are raising concerns about the accessibility of the City TV, and will she make representation to DCMS on reorganising the EPG guide? Cabinet Secretary. We're in regular discussion with DCMS on a number of issues, and clearly the EPG, EPG uh, positioning is one of those areas. And in relation to uh, possibilities of reconfiguration with some of the other changes that are happening, so very conscious of that issue. And obviously the visibility of um, local television um, on, the, on the first page or, or high up in EPG does make a difference, um, and it's something that we're supportive of. Many thanks. Question three, Roderick Campbell. He was adding also to ask the Scottish Government when it last met representatives of the European Union and what matters were discussed. Minister Humza Yousaf. Thank the member for 
The question is, Scottish ministers regularly meet with representatives of all EU institutions. For example, the Cabinet Secretary uh, Fiona Hislop was in Brussels yesterday speaking for the UK at the Cultural and Audiovisual Council, where discussions included how Europe can cooperate and prevent the destruction and illicit trafficking of cultural heritage in conflict areas. Uh, a number of ministers meet with EU representatives on a wide variety of issues. Thank you. Mr. Campbell. European Commission is carrying out a fitness check of the birds and habitats directives and that these directives protect a number of areas in my constituency of North East Fife. Can, you, can the Minister advise what the Scottish Government's position is in relation to the retention of the directives and will the Minister commit to pressing the UK Government for early confirmation of the UK Government's position? Minister. Thank the Member for the question. The Minister for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform has overseen the Scottish Government's contribution to the UK Government's response. Uh, they are in the evidence-gathering phase of the fitness check of the two nature directives which the member alludes to. As the member will be aware, that the fitness check is part of an established European Commission programme of regulatory, regulatory fitness, uh, not, a change or, uh, not a change in the scope uh, or objective of EC law. The UK Government's response to evidence-gathering phase has been published by the Commission on the Europa website. A Commission conference was held last week to consider the draft emerging, uh, emerging findings from that phase. And the Commission has announced that the final outcome will be known in 2016. Thank you. Supplementary, Anne McTaggart. Sir, um, whilst the Minister is, is answering that question for Roger Campbell, can I ask him what role um, he will be playing in the EU discussions over the security following the recent events in Europe? Minister. Oh, I thank the member uh, for the question. In terms of the incidents that took place in Paris, it's fair to say the working between Scottish Government, UK Government and then wider European partners has been very strong. Uh, we have a link between the Justice Secretary uh, and the Home Secretary and we're constantly updated in terms of being involved in COBRA discussions and any other resilience discussions uh, within that. But I can give the member the strongest assurances that cooperation, not just in these islands, but across the continent and security and safety of our citizens is our number one priority shared, as I say, uh, across the continent. Thanks. Jamie McGregor. Uh, does the Minister agree with the principle of devolution of power? And if so, does the Minister agree with me that this Parliament should support the UK Government in its pursuits to achieve renegotiations of the EU, to achieve a leaner and more competitive EU with the UK at its heart? Minister? I believe in uh, lots of, uh, all devolution of power. Uh, I should say that would be unsurprising to the Member. When it comes to the EU's reform, I would say that we've uh, made our case known in terms of reform. We have a 28-page document, which if the member hasn't read, I'll happily forward on to him. In terms of reform, we do believe that inform sh uh, reform should be, uh, of Europe should be uh, sought in a positive manner as, as opposed to necessarily threatening uh, the EU with a referendum. We've put forward our case for reform. Uh, the UK government has put forward theirs. So some of that we, which we would absolutely agree with in terms of giving national parliaments and devolved parliaments more say over issues in Europe. But somewhere we have a bit of a disagreement and those will come to play and to the fore, I'm sure, as and when uh, the EU referendum is announced and the campaign begins in earnest. Thanks. Question four, Claire Baker. To ask the Scottish Government how it promotes gender equality in the arts. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, the Scottish Government supports the arts primarily through Creative Scotland as part of their ongoing equalities, diversity and inclusion review. They are improving equalities, monitoring data collection and analysis across all protected characteristics. They are gathering, gathering more sophisticated data on employment, progression and representation of women uh, in the arts. And Creative Scotland's Equalities, Diversity and Inclusion Report 2015 uh, was published on the 30th, 30th of April. Within the arts bodies funded by Creative Scotland in 30th women made up 58% of the workforce and 65% of the operational management. Creative Scotland were the first public body to meet the First Minister's 50-50 by 2020 equality target for their board earlier this year. Thanks. Claire Baker. Um, the Cabinet Secretary's answer, but she will be aware of concerns over under-representation under of women in creative roles. And while Creative Scotland are collecting data from organisations they fund, they are only collecting the employee workforce data, which excludes freelance or other contracts which are directly related to creative roles, such as actors or directors. I hope the Cabinet Secretary will agree with me that if we are going to address gender equality and creative roles, we need the proper information to direct this policy. And will she commit to raise this matter with Creative Scotland? 
Yes, I'm happy to do so. It's an issue that I have had long had concerns about, and I think it would be a, a great shared endeavour if uh, cross-party we could make that one of the priorities to ensure that not just in the publicly funded organisations, but in the culture of the culture of this country, uh, that we ensure that women are uh, represented at all levels, and particularly where there's cre uh, creative direction, or particularly in freelancing, which it might not be as easy to get in terms of uh, reports. So I'm happy to share that endeavour. Thanks. Question five, Richard Baker. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to encourage films to be made in Scotland to boost local economies. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we support and work with Creative Scotland to champion Scotland as a premier location to create high quality productions for both the large and small screen. Creative Scotland's location service works closely with regional offices across Scotland to bring productions to local areas and benefit from Scotland's superb locations and highly trained crews. Sunset Song, which had scenes filmed across various locations in Aberdeenshire and the Mairns region, brought a boost to the local economy during filming and fans of Grasset Gibbons' novel can avail themselves of a Visit Scotland interactive map, which highlights the various locations used, including Fetter Cairn, Glen Tanner Estate and our Busnet Church. Thanks, Richard Baker. The Cabinet Secretary has astutely preempted my, my question because I was going to ask her to join me in congratulating Visit Scotland and uh, their partner org organisations on the production of the film map uh, link, uh, of uh, the sites in Aberdeenshire where Sunset Song uh, was shot and indeed it's been a critically acclaimed film. So, so the what, question is... What further action will be taken by... The Scottish Government and indeed by Visit Scotland and other agencies involved in boosting local economies to ensure more films are shot in these areas with similar impacts we hope upon those local economies. Well, the member may be aware of uh, recent development funding and also production funds that have been av made available from uh, Creative Scotland to encourage uh, more filming in Scotland. But in terms of the local economic reach, the idea that, and the, 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 the proposal that actually showing films will promote the area, I think, is a very, very strong one. A number of people come to Scotland precisely because they've seen the scenery. And I think the initiatives such as Visit Scotland, but indeed others, to promote the location of Scotland and to see our cities and our wonderful scenery. And there are a number of films that are already still being filmed just now, which have yet to hit our screens, which will further promote Scotland in the future. Yeah, thanks, Chris Thank you, Mr. Like Richard Baker, I very much enjoyed uh, Sunset Song as well, and uh, as a premiere of Sunset Song, which is going to be on the 4th of December. Would the Cabinet Secretary, Secretary agree with me that locating the Scottish Film Studio in the North East would be fantastic, and the City of Discovery, Dundee, could encourage filmmakers in the North East to stay and work here while actively encouraging international filmmakers to discover the best Scotland has, both visually and creatively. As the member may be aware, we're currently at a critical stage in commercial and confidential negotiations for a new film studio in Scotland. Um, he should also be aware that we can't progress film studio proposals that require 100% public funding and so therefore a private uh, sector partner is required. Uh, we've not been approached by any private sector partner in the North East um, uh, and I'm sure that might become as, uh, uh, some disappointment but obviously there are opportunities for private sector partners across Scotland seeing the talent that we have and the opportunities uh, to come forward with uh, proposals. But it is quite, it's, it's obviously quite clear that uh, Sunset Song will do a great deal for the Scottish film industry. Uh, those of you who have not got one of the early tickets to try and see um, one of the early premieres uh, on the third 30th of November, I would encourage you to do so. It's a, a, a fantastic film in so many different ways and very emotionally charged as well as uh, visually beautiful. Excellent. Question six, Bruce Crawford. Thank you for saying that, Mr. Crawford, please. It's blinked at me, President yeah. Officer. I guess that means it's working. Um, no. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making in relation to the conservation of the historic built environment. The Scottish Government has established our newest non-departmental public body, Historic Environment Scotland, to provide strong and effective leadership to the sector to ensure our unique heritage is enjoyed for years to come. The new body came into existence on the 1st of October 2015 and will lead on the delivery of Scotland's first ever Historic Environment Strategy, Our Place in Time. Uh, the strategy was developed in collaboration with partners from across the sector. Uh, our recent very successful conference, which was held in Dundee, drew a wide range of heritage bodies together to explore the many ways in which the strategy is currently being delivered, as well as looking at how best to ensure delivery of our shared ambition for Scotland's historic environment going forward. Thank you. Bruce Crawford. 
the Cabinet Secretary for a reply. And can the Sec Cabinet Secretary tell me when it's expected that the National Conservation Centre in Stirling, located at the engine side at Fourth Side, will be open for business? What its primary purpose will be? What benefits will flow from its activities, both for conservation in Scotland and, as you might expect, from my own perspective, for employment and the economy in the Stirling constituency? And incidentally, um, the Foresight area would make a fantastic location for Scotland's new film studio. Many thanks. Mm. I, th I thank the member for the question. Uh, I'm very pleased to confirm that the Engine Shed uh, Historic Environment uh, Scotland's ambitious uh, project to create Scotland's first national centre dedicated to building conservation is on schedule to open at Forthside in summer 2016. I think it's a, yet another boost for uh, Stirling and its profile in terms of our, our heritage. It will focus on raising standards and awareness. It will have education, training um, uh, opportunities, research in different areas and digital documentation and indeed climate, climate change adaptation for the built environment. It's already uh, receiving significant international interest and there are great uh, global opportunities for Scottish expertise to be showcased there as well as being a boost for Stirling itself. Thank you. Question 7, Neil Bibby. Yep. Phone for Mr Bibby, please. Put me to in. ask... Um, Joanne, yeah. well, now, uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it's taken to promote culture in West Scotland. Secretary Fiona Hislop. In 2014-15, Creative Scotland invested over 20 point, 20 point, sorry, invested over £2.6 million through 50 awards to individuals and organisations based in the West uh, Scotland region. In 2015-16, £1.2 million in the six local authorities who make up the West of Scotland parliamentary region through the YMI school-based music making uh, fund and with Creative Scotland investment of £1.4 million between 2015, 16 and 17, 18, three regular funded organisations, Cove Park, the Beacon Arts Centre and Hands Up for Trad are being supported in the West of Scotland. Thank you. Neil Bibby. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that Paisley has recently launched a bid to become the UK City of Culture in 2021. Paisley has a rich cultural heritage and has produced many famous music artists, actors and poets. The bid would also act as a catalyst for job creation and regeneration with a multi-million pound facelift for the museum as part of the project. Does the Minister agree with me that Paisley has a strong bid for the UK City of Culture in 2021? And given to date there has never been a Scottish host, can I ask the Minister what uh, she will do to help Paisley in the bidding process? Absolutely. Uh, I am very aware of the Paisley 2021 bid. I met with uh, Renfrewshire Council Leader Mark McMillan, uh, Chief Executive and the Bid Director on the 27th of October to hear more about their ambitious plans. And there may be uh, other uh, bids coming from Scotland, but he's quite right to identify that there's a strong case to have a Scottish bid. Obviously, we can learn from the experience of Dundee, who uh, uh, performed extremely well but didn't secure in, in the, final, um, the, the final regard the, the actual bid itself. But the UK City of Culture, I think, uh, is a, a, an opportunity to show, showcase culture and heritage. He's, uh, he's quite right. Paisley has got a rich uh, heritage in lots of different aspects, whether it's contemporary music, but also in wider heritage, and not least in terms of textile and design. So I think it's a strong bid going forward. But as you might appreciate, there may be other bids coming forward too from Scotland. Many thanks. Question 8, Alex Ferguson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to support and promote the local newspaper and magazine industry. Uh, local newspapers and magazines are a vital part of our healthy democracy. Uh, the industry also benefits from business rates policies, which includes our decision to cap the business rates poundage below inflation this year and our small business bonus scheme. The small business bonus scheme alone removes or reduces the rates for over an estimated 99,000 properties, the equivalent of, of two in every five, and that provides much welcome support to many small firms, such as some local newspapers and the magazine industry. In addition, the Scottish Government and public bodies use local media, including newspapers, to advise, uh, advertise campaigns such as preventative health and road safety. Thank you. Alex Rex. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that response. As she rightly says, local newspapers are and, and remain an important part of our culture and indeed remain a vital source of information for our individual communities, particularly in rural communities like mine in Galloway and West Dumfries, which I would add would make an excellent base for Scotland's fledgling film industry. Um, but the UK Government, as I'm sure she's equally aware, is currently undertaking a complete review of business rates for weekly titles, which is expected to look at whether newspapers might have partial exemption from these rates. Despite the measures she's already Question. indicated, 
Can I ask the Minister if she will support a review of business rates for local newspapers? Well, in, in terms of uh, the Scottish Government's initiative, uh, the Small Business uh, Bonus Scheme is certainly a leader in terms of helping small businesses. So there's a benefit, uh, a probably a competitive benefit for Scotland compared to the rest of uh, the UK currently in relation to that. We look forward to hearing the response for that review that he's undertaking. Uh, but obviously, uh, we've yet to hear any initiatives that might come from uh, on the back of that, but we will examine them when they come forward. Many thanks. And we'll now move to questions on infrastructure, investment and cities. Question one, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to encourage partnership working to secure growth and investment for cities. Mr Derek Mackay. Cities and their regions play a central role in driving economic growth. The Scottish Government is committed to working individually and collectively with Scotland cities to optimise that growth for the benefit of the whole of Scotland. The Scottish Cities Alliance fosters partnership working between our cities and Scottish Government to secure growth and investment. In addition, our support for the city deals in Scotland is predicated on strong regional partnerships that include the wider public sector. James Dornan. Thank the Minister for that answer. Will the Minister join with me in welcoming recent news that the number of new business start-ups has surged in Glasgow, including, of course, in my constituency of Glasgow Cathcart over the last year? Minister. Of course, I welcome that news and that very positive national picture as well. In fact, the number of businesses in Scotland as a whole is at a record level of 361,345 as at March 2015, an increase of 7.8 per cent since 2014. This underlines our commitment to ensuring a supportive business environment in partnership with local authorities through the Business Gateway Initiative, working to secure businesses, including new businesses, across the country. Thanks. Um, question two, in the name of Neil Finlay, has not been lodged. A satisfactory explanation has been provided. Question three, Nigel Don. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making toward the ending the practice of trains discharging effluent onto lines. Minister Derek Mackay. Working with ScotRail, Transport Scotland has agreed a programme of works to install collection tanks on the only remaining trains operated by ScotRail that still discharge effluent onto the track. This programme is uh, commenced at North Brems workshops in uh, Springburn, Glasgow, with the first trains fitted with tanks and returned to service. The target completion date for these trains to be fitted is the 31st of December 2017, which is three years earlier than planned. Many thanks. Nigel Don. Can I just say I'm very, very grateful to the Minister for that reply. It does seem to be uh, ancient technology that we should be spreading effluent online, and I'm very grateful for his reply. Many thanks. Alex Johnson, a supplementary. Uh, the minister will, uh, uh, will the Minister confirm that that will mean that the only trains which will continue to discharge in the line after that date are trains that sneak across the border from England? But will he further confirm that with the replacement programme on these lines that that will end uh, in 2018? And the trains that are responsible to me as Transport Minister through uh, ScotRail and other franchise I have accelerated that programme and I have to pay credit to the trade unions as well who campaigned on this issue uh, and worked with me and we went through the programme to accelerate it to ensure that the appropriate tanks were fitted because of course it is messy uh, to uh, the staff and of course unpleasant for everyone working uh, on the railway line. So those are directly responsible to, for, to me. Yes, those uh, lines will be clear, those tanks and those trains uh, will be addressed. And there are some still responsible for the, de to the Department for Transport where they haven't had that programme accelerated may still be discharging on Scotland's railways. But I do know it is a matter they are still looking at, but certainly I'm happy with the actions that this government has taken. Hey, thanks. Question for Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it's had with the UK Government regarding the HS2 rail project coming to Scotland. Well, the Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, Investment and Cities met with the Secretary of State for Transport, Patrick McLaughlin, in June of this year to discuss the ongoing study by HS2 Limited, which was jointly commissioned by UK and Scottish Governments into the broad options for expending high-speed railways to the north of England and Scotland to achieve a journey time of not more than three hours between London and Edinburgh, Glasgow. The Cabinet Secretary also met with Robert Goodwill, MP, Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Transport, earlier this month at the HS2 Limited Supply Chain Conference in Edinburgh. 
Yes, Colin Beatty. Minister, for that response. There are unconfirmed reports that costs for the HS2 project have increased by 30 per cent to £30 billion. If this is the case, <coughs> can the Minister indicate how, how such a rise in costs is likely to affect Scotland's transport budget and the overall viability of the project? Minister? Well, the difference in cost, as I understand it, is down to the 2011 prices with actual cost and then, of course, projected uh, cost that uh, DFT is monitoring. And because of the current expenditure to date being built into the Barnet formula, if that precedent continues, there should be no impact to our transport budget. But of course, we keep a very close uh, eye on that. And it is worth reminding the Chamber that we do support the extension uh, of high speed rail physically to Scotland so that we enjoy the actual benefits rather than simply it being made easier to travel more quickly to the north uh, of England. But clearly, we're keeping a very close eye on cost and the, the necessary. Uh, uh, expenditure uh, for Scotland. Well, thanks. Uh, question five, Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it has carried out an assessment to determine the average cost of building new railway stations. Minister. Yeah, there, have, there have been no assessment carried out to determine an average cost of the building of a new railway station. Many factors, variable factors, such as the size and location of a proposed station, associated groundworks and the requirement for additional infrastructure can impact on the cost of any station. Mary Fee. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? One of the key criteria for applying to the Scottish Stations Fund is access to third-party funding and that promoters must be able to demonstrate that alternative funding sources for the proposed improvements have been exhausted. At a time when budgets are tight for local authorities, does the Minister believe that scouting for private funding is the best use of council resources? Minister. Uh, sometimes I think there may be useful uh, and necessary interventions from the private sector, uh, whether it's through planning uh, obligations or so on, that may be appropriate in helping to contribute to infrastructure uh, so they pay their way in transport. Uh, improvements. There are a number of examples uh, that can be showcased to show how this can be done. So I think in partnership we should continue to focus on invest investment uh, in the railways. This government has committed some £5 billion in terms of uh, railway investment. But of course, if we can leave it in other sources of funding, then we can do even more for the railways in Scotland. Thanks. Question six, Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what upgrades are planned for the A9 north of Inverness. Minister. We want the very best for communities and road users of the A9, and that is why we'll continue to improve transport infrastructure in the north. In fact, since 2007, on the A9 north of Inverness, this Government has invested £5.5 million in the A9 Helmsdale to Order of Case Ness improvements, Phase 2 scheme, and £13.3 million on the refurbishment programme for the Keswick Bridge to deliver a reliable crossing for road users in the next 30 years, in addition to routine maintenance. An improvement scheme to remove the hairpin bend on the A9 at Berrydale Braes is also currently in preparation, in addition to routine maintenance activities over the next three years in excess of £1 million of resurfacing, is also planned for the A9 north of Inverness. Thanks. Rob Gibson. I thank the Minister for that answer. You know, what is the likely timescale of the public local inquiry on the Berrydale Braes? Because the Minister ought to know that the travelling public and developers who need changes that will help larger vehicles get up there want to have some certainty about when we're likely to see a decision on this and when we're then likely to see the actual development take place at the Berrydale Braes. Minister. I understand the demands for the work at Berrydale Brewers. I really do, but the matter for timescales is independent of government. It rests with the DPEA, a matter I remember very well from my previous brief within planning. However, a pre-inquiry meeting is scheduled to take place on the 2nd of December, and the date and duration of the inquiry will be discussed at that pre-inquiry meeting. But I say again, I understand the local demands for that improvement project. And thanks, Dave Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. A number of Highland farmers have approached me about uh, the lack of laybys for farm vehicles and other slow moving vehicles on the E9 North. Uh, does the Minister accept that allowing opportunities for slow moving vehicles to pull over is a major contributor to road safety? And would the Minister look again at this problem? Minister. Well, of course, we are 
delivering the duelling of the A9 and we'll look further at spending plans to see what else can be done around road infrastructure improvement and very mindful of road safety issues. So of course that is a matter that we'll keep uh, in mind but of course we must also balance that with our uh, spending commitments and availability of spending which of course is a a matter being discussed right now in the House of Commons as we find out what the spending review means for Scotland. Thanks. Question 7, Malcolm Chisholm. To ask the Scottish Government what action the Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, Investment and Cities will take to facilitate the creation of low emission zones in Scotland's major cities. Minister. Uh, we have a, a vision which we set out in our Cleaner Air for Scotland strategy for Scotland uh, to have the cleanest air in Europe and low emission zones are a key part of that strategy. Over the next year we will develop guidance and a new framework to enable local authorities and their partner organisations to work together to deliver the best measures including low emission zones for their air quality management areas. Uh, Minister, for that answer, the Minister will remember in the debate last week I highlighted the uh, problems of uh, air pollution in uh, parts of my constituency. So, uh, will the government commit to introducing low emission zones in key cities with air pollution problems by 2018? And will it, crucially, will it commit to supporting local authorities' the implementation uh, of low emission zones through full funding? Minister. We will certainly be supportive by way of policy and interventions and also around the, the funding package that exists. Of course, there are necessary arrangements to be put in place in terms of guidelines and monitoring as we go through that programme to 2018. The, the current programme is indeed described uh, as ambitious, but we will be supportive as we can with local authorities as we uh, tackle air quality in partnership. Thanks. Question 8, Adam Ingram. Sir, to ask the Scottish Government what progress it has made in ensuring that a Maybole bypass achieves the status of a shovel-ready project. Minister. Following consideration of a public local inquiry reporter's recommendations for the A77 Maybole bypass, Scottish Ministers have decided that orders should be made without modification. We are now progressing the design work for this important scheme with a view to publishing made orders early next year, which, subject to no legal challenge, will complete the statutory process. Thanks, Adam Ingram. Well, it's good news, Minister. Can we now expect a financial commitment uh, for this project from the Minister and when this might be forthcoming? Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government remains committed to commencing construction of the A77 Mabel bypass at the earliest possible opportunity, subject to the satisfactory completion of the statutory process and allocation of funding from future spending reviews, which will, of course, be informed by today's announcements. Many thanks. Question 9, Jim Hume. Jim Hume is not in the chamber. Um, question 10 has been withdrawn. A satisfactory explanation on Mr Doris's behalf has been provided and we therefore move to the next item of business which that concludes question time and the next item of business is debate on motion number 14942.